Well, well, we have now come to uh, chapter 13 of the book, The Wow Factor, More Adventures in Revival. The title of this chapter is The Aftermath, When Bad Things Happen to a Good Revival. Let's begin. Some live under the false assumption that real revival will never have any issues connected to it. A friend of mine who was a quality pastor with a good record and who served on the statewide board of his denomination experienced a significant revival in his church and city. Among the scores of people who came to salvation was a man involved with the mafia. The first time he came to the revival, he stepped into the lobby and then ran from the meeting, spinning the tires on his pickup as he attempted to flee the presence of God. However, that presence drew him back again the next night. As he stepped into the church lobby, he was confronted by a presence of God that put him on the floor. Even before the service began, this man with mafia connections crawled from the lobby to the altar area of the building to get right with God. Yet 17 weeks into that outpouring, the pastor received a petition calling for a business meeting to vote out the evangelist. Not long after, they called for his departure as well. Because of these actions, the denominational board felt the revival had not been genuine. Some pastors and church leaders allow issues, whether perceived or real, to keep them from entering a move of God. A church located in the deep southern part of the United States asked his pastor to leave because of revival. I was invited by his successor to come and minister at the church. I went to preach out of curiosity. I wanted to learn whether my friend had made mistakes in leading that revival, or if indeed the people truly did not want a move of God. It soon became clear to me the people did not want revival. My experience during the four days of the scheduled meeting was unique. I can only describe it by saying each night the Holy Spirit would come after the crowd had left the building. It was so pronounced that the pastor began pleading with his church to linger longer because God was showing up just after they left. However, they did not do so and the Holy Spirit was not inclined to reveal himself while they were there. The pastor told Linda the revival was about him and his past. As a teen, the church he attended experienced a revival. Tragically, what began well turned sour. As a result, he grew paranoid over revival. He recognized the revival they were experiencing was God asking him if he was willing to move beyond his past and allow revival to come to his church. I do not want you to be afraid of a real move of God. I believe revival is worth any price required. In this chapter, we will look at a biblical passage that describes the aftermath of revival. Then I will share stories of the bad and ugly of revivals I have experienced. The purpose will be to prepare you emotionally for the types of things you may encounter. I want you to know you are not alone. And I do not want you blindsided. However, I do not intend to leave you feeling helpless. I want to help prepare you with some suggestions for dealing with some of the issues of revival. The story of Elijah. The scripture reveals that revival brings issues. 
1 Kings chapter 17 through 19, tell the story of the events preceding, during, and following major revival. In this revival, the entire nation repented of sin. Miracles accompanied the ministry of Elijah. Please understand, revival creates opposition. In the text, Jezebel, the pagan queen, was stirred up. Some opposition is from our human flesh, while other opposition is demonic in origin. Ahab returns to Jezreel from the outpouring of the Spirit on the mountain. He has seen the fire consume the sacrifice. He has seen the people fall on their faces in repentance. He has probably been drenched by the rain as it fell on him as he was coming back to Jezreel. Yet with all of that, he has not been changed. He does not come back and say to his wife Jezebel, Jezzy, it's time for you and me to repent, to get things right with God. Ahab is like some people who seem to see everything and yet miss everything. They fail to grasp the message behind the manifestations. No, Ahab comes back and reports all that Elijah had done. In one sense, I suppose that is human nature. Ahab only seemed to notice the human element. He failed to understand the fire that consumed the sacrifice had not been started by Elijah. The rain that fell from the darkened clouds had not come from Elijah. These were God events. He should have said, Jesse, let me tell you what God did up there on that mountain. Jezebel responds to the information that the prophets of Baal had been put to death with the sword by sending a message to Elijah. It was not a message indicating realization that God had come into the camp. It was not a message asking, what must I do to get right with God? Instead, she tells Elijah she plans on killing him. She should have walked in repentance, but instead, revenge came into her heart. Your revival will not cause Satan to flee your city. Often, revival simply stirs up Jezebel. Secondly, Revival will not remove your humanity. James chapter 5, verses 17 and 18 puts it this way. Elias was a man, subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Elijah experienced the same passions as we do. He felt the same things we feel. He experienced fear. In 1 Kings 19 and 3, he runs for his life. Some scholars believe since Satan could not stop the revival, he plotted to take Elijah out of it and thereby limit its effectiveness. And this appeared to be what happened. Perhaps Elijah was caught off guard by the ferocity of Jezebel's attack. He may have been a, a bit overconfident because of the great victory God had given him. Elijah became isolated. He left his servant behind, perhaps expressing a desire to escape. Scholars are divided, but it is at least possible Elijah left his armor bearer. I've watched Satan seek to isolate revivalists. He understands that they are easier to pick off that way. Denominational or church opposition, real or perceived, contributes to this tendency. Elijah experienced depression. In fact, 
He prayed to die. Please understand that revival will not make you immune to any of these problems. Do not be surprised when fear, flight, escapism, or depression surface. Just do not give in to them. The good news is God's Spirit nurtures revival. In 1 Kings 19, 5 through 7, angels ministered to Elijah. Let me encourage revivalists by saying, you too will be ministered to by angels, whether you see them or not. God supernaturally sustained Elijah. We read how God provided rest and food. God baked him a cake. God knows what you need and he will supply it to you. Sometimes in revival, you need to pull back and rest in the Lord. It is not unscriptural or unspiritual to have physical needs met, such as food and rest. Then, God prepared a supernatural encounter for Elijah, at which time he received a new assignment. The not-so-good, the bad, and the ugly of revival. I love to tell the stories of what the Lord does in revival. One prophetic word indicated I had become famous for the stories. Then I went on to say there was a revival coming, the stories of which I would not be able to keep up with. However, not every story of revival is one of glory. Some are not so good. Some are bad. Some are downright ugly. I am going to share some of the challenges we have seen surface in revival. I'm going to do that to help you understand how Satan and human flesh will resist moves of God. Even during revival, war can break out over the music. Music is such a vital part of our worship of the Lord that we should not be surprised that Satan would choose to fight it so hard. Many pastors have discovered that revival can lead to a two-camp church. For one pastor, the two camps centered around the music and the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. He attempted to resolve the situation by starting a second service. The early service sang more traditional hymns and, and did not expect any out-of-the-box moments. The second service sang the more contemporary revival types of songs and every service had a full-on expectation. Now, I commend the pastor for his willingness to look for a solution, but the plan was only partially successful. He discovered there were some in the first service who were embarrassed over what was happening in the second service and did not want any revival manifestations to happen in their church, period. In another church, the word of knowledge regarding sin and the accompanying call to repentance created such opposition that it led to the closure of a revival. In another church, one woman was extremely upset over her perceived loss of position and ministry due to extended meetings. The extended meetings had brought a temporary shutdown of other events to focus on responding to the Holy Spirit. She began pressuring her pastor over when her private kingdom could start again. There will always be the challenge of creating space for God to move in revival and determining which ministries are to be restored and when this is to happen. Sometimes revival creates interesting, but perhaps not so edifying conversations or incidents. In one of those, I was making my way from the rear of the auditorium to the front, shaking hands with people as I went. One man 
pointedly refused to shake my hand and, and told me he had come to rebuke me in the Lord. And he called me a charlatan. On another occasion, a, a young gangbanger told the person who had brought him to the meeting he wanted to punch me. In yet another service, a, a lady attempted to karate kick me while I was praying for her. A different tactic was displayed by the man who wanted to put me in his hip pocket. Later, he called the religious press to stir up problems. I can think of two men in different cities who would come to the weekly revival prayer meeting and then pointedly refuse to participate. Their very presence created a shadow on the prayer meeting. I was the evangelist in a for a seven-week revival in a northern state. And during those seven weeks, we saw 300 people commit their lives to Jesus Christ. However, for many, that revival was controversial because people falling to the ground was a part of those meetings. These manifestations invoke memories in the minds of some of a period in their church history when the city had rejected and persecuted them. They were afraid they were going to find themselves repeating that cycle. One individual told the pastor, it took us 30 years to live down this reputation and we do not want it again. Revival may also bring personal rejection. For 12 years, I was not allowed to preach at what was my home church. My pastor, who was a friend, a board member, and a good man, was afraid of revival. Therefore, he would not allow me to preach in the church. I am reasonably certain I had some meetings canceled because I was seen to be a part of that Brownsville thing. I will hasten to say I also had other doors open to me for the same reason. Rejection is not pleasant, but sometimes it is a part of the price of going after revival. The pastor of one revival church has, on more than one occasion, had his integrity questioned. He was even accused of manufacturing revival. Division had occurred within the larger family. Some have challenged the physical reactions this pastor experiences when the manifest presence of God comes upon him. He often has difficulty standing or, or even speaking. In personal conversation, he told me that these sometimes make him feel foolish. But he is willing to be a fool for Christ if the Lord asks that of him. A former national leader of my denomination, during a time of national exposure of our movement, because of the moral failures of certain high-profile preachers, told a group of evangelists, being misunderstood is the price of leadership. Pastors are often stunned when those they thought would embrace revival do not. On the other hand, they are often pleasantly surprised when those they did not think would embrace revival do. Criticism is a major tool of the devil to fight you and revival. During one of the most significant revivals I have ever preached, the wife of a nearby pastor began to criticize us. Based upon misconceptions, she picked up from people in their church who attended the revival. In another very significant revival, we became aware of criticism from the pulpit of a neighboring pastor who had never been to the revival. Though he had not attended the revival, he announced to his church that it was not a revival at all. During a denominational event held at the church where the revival occurred, it was clear his people would not associate with people from the revival. 
a variation of this attitude, was the church who drove hundreds of miles to attend a nationally known revival, but would not cross town to attend the revival that had broken out in their midst. Some simple suggestions. Not everyone will embrace revival, but are there things you can do to decrease the fallout of revival? Absolutely. Here are some suggestions to help resolve these and other similar situations. Probably one of the most important things you can do is teach a lot. Where it is possible, I attempt to explain what God seems to be doing. This teaching often requires a focus on manifestations. My first self-published booklet came about as a direct result of attempting to answer the questions of honest seekers and the objections of the critics. The latter needed to be done to help the former. Teaching not only helps the open, honest questioner, even skeptic, to understand, but it gives a sense of security to people who need to know someone up there is in charge and knows what is going on. A little study of scripture and church history was very helpful for me. Now, teaching does not have to require 30-minute blocks of time. I have found a lot can be accomplished in a three to five minute segment in a service. My second suggestion is to turn down the rhetoric. Let's not create unnecessary enemies. Evangelists can be somewhat notorious for creating straw enemies they then have to knock over. Try to avoid the us versus them mentality of revival. In an earlier chapter, you read of the two camp syndrome. Tragically, we as leaders have sometimes added to this issue by the way we approached revival. Indeed, some approach church life from this vantage point. Not everyone who disagrees is my enemy. Sometimes we create mountains of things that should have remained small hills. Thirdly, I would suggest you try to provide as many options as possible, as did the church I mentioned above. Sometimes they will work, sometimes it will not. I would suggest it is important to pick your battles in revival. Choosing to pick your battles in revival leads to an awareness you will ignore some things. Some things are linked to revival itself and some things are simply an aggravated part of church life. Remember that everything intensifies in revival. Some things do not need to be dignified with a response, but others must always receive one. I will always seek to give time to the honest inquirer. I am willing to dialogue with those who disagree with me if I sense they are seekers of truth. However, in the philosophy of Nehemiah, I am not prepared to come down from building this wall just to debate with you. In my book, The Glory Factor, published by Evergreen Press, I devote an entire chapter to the things successful revival leaders do well. One of these is, do not be afraid to lead. Nature abhors a vacuum. If you don't lead, someone else will. If you are a pastor, I want you to believe God knew revival was going to come when he placed you in that church. Now, he is going to help you. Since many of the controversial issues tend to center around what happens when people are prayed for, be careful how you pray. If possible, heavy hands should be avoided. I work hard not to appear to push. This means be careful 
how you position your hands. During one revival, a youth pastor appeared to be pushing people to the floor. I finally took him under my wing and let him walk with me as I was praying for people. I was very lightly touching people under their elbows. The power of God came and many fell, but it did not appear I was pushing them. When God is in it, He does not need your help. You will need to decide about catchers. In most instances, I recommend catchers be available. They can be a novice or a protection for the novice believer who feels required to fall or for the over-energetic prayer team member who thinks God needs his assistance or for the person sitting in the seat wondering if it is safe to receive prayer. They can also protect you from an unfortunate lawsuit. While I'm on the thought of the catchers, I would suggest training sessions be held for prayer team members and catchers. We should not assume everyone knows how to minister at the altar. I have included in the appendix some guidelines for prayer team members and catchers. These guidelines were borrowed from some guidelines I saw followed at an annual conference in New Zealand. We want the altar to be a safe place. We want it to be a place where people encounter the God who loves them. We want it to be a place where people encounter the God who is so strong and powerful that a holy fear is also generated. However, I also recognize our prayer teams are made up of people. Give people time to grow. Ministry teams will need time to grow. Those being ministered to need time to grow too. I encourage you to stay based on solid Pentecostal biblical foundations and then just let the wind blow. I try never to forget that I am not required to be loved by everyone. I prefer to be accepted by everyone. However, at the end of this life, I will have only one judge who matters. Therefore, I am committed to pleasing him. While this may not appear spiritual, it is very important that you maintain a sense of humor. Learn to laugh at yourself. A sense of humor can diffuse a lot of tough situations. Stay balanced. That may mean going golfing now and then. Focus on the blessings of the revival. I can focus on the critics. I can focus on the cringe factor stuff. Or I can focus on the blessing and what God is doing. One of the wisest things God helped me to do was to develop a mentor. Actually, I cannot take credit. God in His great mercy and compassion on me and those I was going to minister to gave me a relationship with the senior associate pastor of the Brownsville Revival. Kerry Robertson became my go-to guy. When I had questions, which was often, I called him. Not only did I form a relationship with him, but I also formed relationships with other revival junkies. Don't be afraid of people God places in your life to help you. You may not follow all their counsel, but these relationships will protect you and the kingdom of God. Finally, welcome to revival. Recognize some stuff is going to happen. You are going to grow. God will not fall off of his throne. And that concludes the reading of the chapters of the book, The Wow Factor, More Adventures in Revival. We have finished the chapters of the book, but I'm going to read today the appendixes. Appendix 1 is Signs and Wonders in the Book of Acts. 
Number one, well, it does not use the phrase signs and wonders. Acts 1 and 3 says Jesus showed himself to his disciples after his death and resurrection by many infallible proofs being seen of them 40 days. Number two, in Acts 1, 9, Jesus ascends into heaven in the plain sight of his followers. Number three, in Acts 2, 11, we find the church speaking in tongues in the language of the hearers. This had been preceded by the sound of a wind and tongues of fire. Number four, nameless signs and wonders were done by the apostles. Acts 2.43. Number five, the healing of a lame man in Acts 3, 1 through 11. Number six, a house was shaken, Acts 4.31, which also says they were filled with the Holy Spirit, boldness, great power, and great grace. The followers of Jesus had prayed for boldness to speak the word and for the Lord to grant healings and signs and wonders in the name of Jesus. Number seven, Ananias and Sapphira fell dead. That's Acts 5, 5 through 10. Number eight, signs and wonders, including healing by Peter's shadow and people who were vexed with unclean spirits being healed. Acts chapter 5, verses 12 through 17. Number nine, the apostles were delivered from prison by angels. That's Acts 5, 18 and 19. Number 10, Stephen the deacon, full of faith and power, does great wonders and miracles among the people in Acts 6 and 8. The word for faith is pistis. It appears 244 times and is translated 239 of those times in the King James as faith. It includes the thought of conviction of the truth of something. Stephen is also said to be full of power. The word is dunamis. It seems to me the thought is that Stephen did these great wonders and miracles because of the combination of faith and anointing. Virtue was flowing, and he was operating at a level of faith for it to happen. It is possible for both to occur. The phrase wonders and miracles is elsewhere translated signs and wonders. Number 11. Philip the Evangelist preaches in Samaria, and they see great signs and wonders occur. Demoniacs were delivered, and the sick were healed. Particular notice is given that the lame began to walk, and those with palsy were healed. That's Acts 8, 5-7. through seven. Number 12. Peter and John laid hands on the believers in Samaria. This is Philip's revival. And they received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Acts 8 and 17. Number 13, Philip is translated by the Spirit of God to another preaching assignment. Acts 8, 39 and 40. Number 14, Saul of Tarsus experienced a bright light that caused him to fall to the earth. He heard an audible voice from heaven. He is struck blind for three days. During that time, he has a vision of a man named Ananias coming and putting his hands on him to receive his sight. The vision was fulfilled, so Saul, Paul, received his sight and was filled with the Holy Spirit. This is a whole series of connected supernatural events that could only appear to be signs and wonders in Acts 9, 1 through 18. Number 15, Peter was involved in healing of Aeneas, who had been bedfast for eight years. That's Acts 9, 32 through 35. Number 16, Dorcas is raised from the dead, Acts 9, 36 to 42. And number 17, Peter experiences a trance and vision, that's Acts 10, 9 to 19, and 11, 1 through 18. Number 18, an angel appears in a vision to Cornelius, giving him instructions to send for Peter. He even tells him where Peter is at. That's Acts 10, 3 through 6. Number 19. The Holy Spirit is poured out on the household of Cornelius, evidenced by them speaking in tongues while Peter preaches to them. That's Acts 10, 44 through 47. 
number 20. The angel of the Lord delivers Peter from prison again. Acts 12, 1 through 19. Number 21, Herod is smitten by the angel of the Lord because he gave not God the glory and died when the people called him a god. Acts 12, 23. Number 22, Elamus the sorcerer is struck blind for a season by God as either prophesied by Paul or called down on him by Paul. Acts 13, 8 through 12. Number 23. In Acts 14 and 3, the Lord gave signs and wonders through the hands of Paul and his co-laborers to give testimony to the word of God they preached. Number 24, in Acts 14, 8 to 18, the Lord heals a crippled man through the ministry of Paul. Number 25, in Acts 15, 12, Paul and Barnabas recount to the church the signs and wonders the Lord had done through them among the Gentiles. The specific signs and wonders are not named. Number 26, in Acts 16, 16 through 18, the Apostle Paul discerns a woman is demonic and proceeds to cast the demon out. This could be called a sign and wonder. Number 27, in Acts 16, 26 through 34, a great earthquake causes the doors of the prison where Paul and Silas are incarcerated to open. Additionally, we read the chains fell off of the prisoners. The commentators almost overwhelmingly agree this was not an ordinary earthquake, but this was divine activity. If this is so, and the reaction by the Philippian jailer suggests he saw it that way as well, then this is a sign and wonder. This would make the third time the Lord had released his people from jail. In Acts chapter 19, this is number 28, Paul laid hands on 12 men, all of whom received the baptism in the Spirit and spoke in tongues. Number 29, in this chapter, several miracles were wrought by the hands of Paul, Acts 19.11. The word for special comes from a word uh, which contains the thought of hitting the mark. It can include the thought of pummeling or hitting one over and over again. Additionally, cloths which had touched Paul's body were laid on those who were sick or demonized, and they were healed and or delivered, Acts 19 and 12. Number 30. Seven sons of Sceva attempted to cast out demons as they had seen Paul do and were beaten up by the demoniac. That's Acts 19, 13 to 16. Number 31. In Acts 20, 19 to 12, Eutychus was raised from the dead. Number 32, Paul perceives, which appears to be a word of knowledge, that the voyage of the ship is that he is preparing to take will be full of danger. He appears to counsel the owner of the ship not to set sail. Acts 27, 10. Number 33, later, verse 23, the angel of the Lord appears to Paul to affirm to him that they will make it to shore safely. At that moment, and again later, Paul urges to the crew to, to eat, prophesying they will all arrive at shore safely. Number 34. In Acts 28, Paul feels no ill effect from the bite of a venomous snake. Number 35. The healing of Publius' father and the subsequent healing of many others on the island in Acts 28. There are 13 references to healing, deliverance, raising of the dead. There were three references to unspecified signs and wonders that probably included healing. There are six references to people being filled with the Holy Spirit, usually speaking in tongues. There are three or four references to divine judgment. There are three references to the apostles being released supernaturally from prison. There are two references to Jesus, his resurrection and ascension. There is one reference to supernatural transportation other than Jesus. There are seven or eight references to trances, visions, audible voices, words of knowledge, prophecy, etc. There is one reference to divine protection from wild animals. Finally, 
There are four references to angels. Appendix number two, ministry team guidelines. And we have 12 of them. Number one, all ministry team members must be actively involved in the pre-service prayer meetings. Only those who attend meetings will receive a ministry name tag and only those wearing a ministry name tag will be released to pray. Number two, listen to any instructions given during the meeting and work as instructed. Number three, all ministry team members must be in the auditorium for the altar call and ready to move quickly to people needing ministry at the instruction of those leading the meeting. Number four, be sensitive at all times. Is the person comfortable with you praying for them? Ask the person their name, what area of need they have come for. Make them feel at ease. The person you are praying for needs to be assured that he or she is the most important person at that moment. Don't become distracted looking at others or around the room while ministering to the person in front of you. Number five, be sensitive in the area of physical contact. Touching the hands, arm, and shoulders or head is appropriate. Number six, good personal hygiene is essential. Have clean teeth, use deodorant, perfume, and breath fresheners at all times. Number seven, Ensure your support person ministers with you as you minister and catches as necessary. Number eight, when deliverance or deep ministry is taking place, wisdom and discretion are to be used in the situation. If manifestations become noisy, check with the ministry coordinator before continuing. Number nine, you may be required to counsel for salvation or personal situations. The prayer room can be used if counseling, if counseling is necessary, but speak to the coordinator first. Number 10. Make sure everyone who is on the altar call has been ministered to before you leave. Number 11. If in doubt, in a situation, ask for advice from a ministry team coordinator. Number 12. Please work on maintaining a close relationship with the Lord both before and during conference week, and actively seek His anointing on your life and ministry. Thank you for all you're making yourself available to serve in this way. We appreciate all you do and are going to do. Appendix number three, Ministry Team Guidelines Catchers. And we have five. Number one, wait until you are called up after the altar call. Stand with your altar ministry workers and wait until instructions are given before you begin talking to them. Look for an open area before you begin to pray. This will avoid falling on others. Number two, the altar ministry worker will remain in close interaction with the person ready to pray a personal prayer and blessing for the individual at this time. Keep your eyes open at all times. Watch the person you are catching at all times. Don't be looking around at others. Number three, you are working with the altar ministry worker as necessary. When behind the person, gently touch them on the shoulders to let them know you are there in preparation to catch them. Remove your hands afterward. If the person falls, hold hands on their back just above their waist, not under their arms. Do not pray aloud. You may pray quietly to yourself. Hearing prayers from behind and in front will be distracting. Number four, if the person requests deliverance, your altar worker will tell one of the team leaders who will notify someone on the platform and they will handle it from there. Do not get into a discussion about it Minimize engagement in conversation. And number five, please be prepared to stay until the end of the service in your assigned position. All prayer ceases when the authorities have left. And again, thank you for all. Thank you all for making yourself available.
to serve in this way. We, I really, we really appreciate all you are going to do.